All right. Okay, everybody can see that basic woodland management, I hope. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, well, thanks to you all again for, for tuning in tonight and joining us. And we'll talk about some, some basic forestry. Um, and this would be really relevant for woodland owners, but also folks who just have an interest in, uh, in the forest land and, and possibly how uh, public lands are managed. We'll talk about some of those types of things too. And, uh, and I think next Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, Shad's going to do another follow-up to, to forest management and look at a specific type of, of control option that you may have when, when you're managing your forest. So um, starting out with this, I wanted to acquaint you all with these two, two characters here. And when you're looking especially at public lands, here in the US, these two really laid the groundwork for us, for what we see here today. And the fellow on the left, uh, you may have heard of, John Muir, and the one on the right, uh, you may have heard of, you may not have, uh, Gifford Pinchot. These two had a little bit different philosophy, but they were good friends. They would go out hiking together, and they, they both served as advisors to, to President Roosevelt. But uh, some of their, their core philosophies did tend to drift apart just a bit. And you know, John Muir, you, you're probably familiar with him, is the founder of the Sierra Club. And he's really considered the, uh, the father of preservation, um, was, was very much a proponent of untouched wilderness. When you think about the Smoky Mountains, when you think about our national parks, very little development, uh, very little active management other than some trails and ecotourism. The fellow on the right, Gifford Pinchot, he's more uh, acquainted with the, with the philosophy of conservation. He was the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service and a really big proponent of the idea of, of wise use and multiple use. That's what Gifford Pinchot gave us. Now, Gifford Pinchot, he decided he wanted to be a forester, and there were no forestry schools in the U.S. at that time. So he went to Germany and got his forestry degree. And he came back, and he worked for one family in particular. And I know the, the ag agents will know who that is, but does anybody else want to take a guess what family he worked for? He managed their forest. Not too awful far from us. You want to top that in the – if you have a guess – Type it in the, the chat box. And since I don't see a, see a guess, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, he, he was the forester for the Vanderbilt family down at, uh, Mount in Pisgah. Asheville. I'm sorry? Mount Pisgah and all, all of that area. Yep. He, uh, he managed um, the Biltmore State at the time, it was over 100,000 acres of woodlands. So he worked around the Biltmore State and he did uh, active management of the forests around the Biltmore State. And as you're going down the interstate in Asheville now, you'll see a tourist attraction on the sign there called the Cradle of Forestry. And that's because that's where forestry as a profession first got started in this, in this country is around the Asheville area because of Gifford Pinchot and because of uh, the Vanderbilt family. <clears throat> and I want to show these, these two pictures. This is the University of the South, and I grew up about 10 miles from the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee. And the picture on the left, that's their chapel, All Saints Chapel. And when you go in, you walk down the center, and you make a left, you notice all these stained glass windows. And a lot of those stained glass windows are dedicated to scientists and philosophers, but there is an actual stained glass window for Gifford Pinchot. And, uh, and when I post pictures on, of that on Instagram or Facebook, there's always a forester that will chime in and say, where is that? I need to, I need to make a pilgrimage there. But, uh, but this is in Suwannee, Tennessee. So these two philosophies we talked about, preservation and conservation, um, here's how we see those today. We, when we talk about preservation, that concept tends to recognize the spiritual side of nature, people getting out into nature and experiencing the mountains and, and the streams. The National Park Service is, uh, is the, the unit of government that's more tied in with the preservation philosophy. And it's managed under the auspices of the U.S. Department of the Interior. 
very little development in these places, uh, except for some ecotourism, some trail development, visitor centers, and so on. You don't see a whole lot of development other than those types of things. And in the National Park Service, um, we see the national parks, the national recreation areas like Big South Fork, which is not very far from here. The national historical parks like Cumberland Gap, those are all part of the National Park Service. And then state parks also tend to fall under that preservation mindset. You don't see a lot of, of logging or active management, just trail development, ecotourism is what you usually see. When you're talking about the conservation viewpoint, what we see today, that really looks at the, the utilitarian value of natural resources, multiple uses of those, uh, those forests. The U.S. Forest Service is on a federal level who we equate with the conservation mindset. And one thing I, I want to point out, because I think a lot of people, they don't realize this, but uh, the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service are not even managed under the same uh, federal cabinet. Uh, we talked about the Park Service being under the U.S. Department of the Interior, while the U.S. Forest Service is under the Department of Agriculture. So again, with the conservation, we see multiple uses, including timber management and, and national forests, just like we have here, Jefferson National Forest, that's all part of that system and part of that mindset. I'll point out here too that I don't think these two philosophies are mutually exclusive. I think there's a lot of folks who, who tend to um, see the value in both. You, there's not a lot of people who are strict conservationists who don't believe in a little bit of preservation. So, so those things are not mutually exclusive. Changing gears now after that introduction with the philosophies behind management, we'll talk about ownership in the two states that we're talking about tonight. In Kentucky, the state of Kentucky has 11.9 million acres of forest and 47% of that is forested. 47% of the state is forested. That's what that 11.9 million acres represents. The ownership um, of the forest land in Kentucky is 78% owned by private individuals, 13% owned by corporations, and I think 2% of that 13% uh, would be forest industry related corporations. 9% of the land in Kentucky be publicly owned, things like state forests and state natural areas, state parks, uh, federal, uh, National Park Service, National Forest Service. In Virginia, 15.7 million acres are forested and that's 62% of the state that is covered with forest. The ownership, it's, it's pretty similar to Kentucky, 66% of our forest land here in Virginia is privately owned. 17% is owned by corporations, and I think 4% of that 17% would be forest industry related, like sawmills and, and uh, wood fiber companies. The rest would be uh, different types of corporations. And then 17% of the land here in Virginia is publicly owned. And so, so these are pretty similar. And here in the East, it, it is, this is pretty par for the course when you get out to the Western part of the US, a lot of the land out there is, is under the ownership of the federal government. It's publicly owned land. And you'll see private ownership being more like 15 to 20% in some cases. But here in the East, a lot of the woodland is privately owned by individuals. Economic value. 37,500 people are employed in forestry related industry in Kentucky. And that amounts to 6.4 billion in industry output every year. In Virginia, 103,000 are employed and that uh, accounts for 17 billion uh, in production every year. I couldn't find this number for Kentucky, but I think it's probably similar for both states. Uh, the societal and ec ecological benefits, uh, they put a price tag on that, just estimated the value as best they could. And that's another 4.1 billion is, is how, they, uh, how they value that. When we talk about forests being managed, well, what, what's that forest being managed for? Lots of times uh, when we talk about it, we're, we're talking a lot about timber, 
timber and, and wood fiber management. But we're also talking about wildlife habitat, uh, the forests are managed for recreation, of course, aesthetics. And that's a pretty big one uh, that you see more than, than you might realize. Folks own a woodland and they want it to look a certain way, especially if they have uh, subdivisions and uh, homes nearby. Watershed protection is a motivator for a lot of people to manage the forest. Non-timber forest products is one that's gaining some traction. We're seeing a lot more uh, non-timber forest products coming about. But most people, um, they're looking at multiple uses. Now, I was a forester with the Kentucky Division of Forestry for four years. And when we would meet with landowners, that was always the first step. We'd find out what their goals were. And 99 out of 100 times, they were interested in multiple things. They may be interested in timber and wildlife habitat and watershed protection, or they might have no interest in timber and be interested in recreation and aesthetics. But very rarely did they just pin down one thing. I think there was one case in Pike County, I, I can remember this, it was, it was uh, uh, so unusual to get a response like that, but somebody told me, they said, well, you know, we don't have kids, we're not really worried about anything except the timber, that's all we're interested in. But, but a lot of people are interested in multiple, multiple uses. And the pictures on the right, that's from uh, when I was an agent in Kentucky, we would do a, a monthly hiking trip. And uh, on one of those trips, we met up with a forester with Daniel Boone National Forest. And he showed us a timber sale and showed us what they had done after the timber sale, how they reclaimed. And at the bottom, that's a picture of a skid road that the logs were formerly hauled out on. They planted that in, in grass that was conducive to wildlife species, so made, uh, made a nice habitat addition for, for wild turkeys. Okay, I, I didn't get uh, Virginia numbers in here, but uh, I think it's pretty close to Kentucky. Uh, when it comes to timber production, Kentucky is the third in the nation as far as hardwood production. The top timber species are gonna be yellow poplar, white oak, and red oak. And when we talk about timber management, that may include things, uh, and I'll talk about these more in depth later, but timber stand improvements, thinnings, regeneration openings, prescribed fire. Those are some of the things when we're discussing active management in a woodlot, those are some of the, uh, the practices that we'll, we'll see put into place. Wildlife, when we're talking about somebody managing their woods for wildlife, that can include things like wildlife food plots. It could, uh, could really look at, if you're doing a timber harvest especially, you identify certain trees that could serve as den trees and you leave those behind, leave those and make those available to the, to the wildlife. Um, I know when I was a forester with, with KDF, we would have people who, who like to install watering holes for wildlife. And, and so that's a, another management practice that could be included on a, on a piece of wooded property. And then a big one that we don't think about a lot is edge management. When you're thinking about when your property transitions from a field to a woodland, you've got that edge area where you've got things like sumac and blackberries and you've got some thick brushy habitat. And that can be a very valuable resource for, for wildlife. And, and so there are ways you can enhance that and protect it and therefore uh, create another stage of habitat for your, for the wildlife on your property. <clears throat> Recreation and aesthetics. Um, we talked some about hunting and recreational leases. Um, I know the, the property that the Nature Conservancy just bought, they have quite a few hunting uh, leases on that that they, they work with people on. Um, so that's a, that's a big, uh, income draw for them. Trail development. I have uh, just a small patch of woods behind my house and it's very steep and we've looked at ways to develop trails that will switch back up the ridge so that we can get more access to our property, get more use of, of those woods. And camping. Uh, camping's a, another big um, recreational draw that folks will spend time and money on. Wildlife viewing. I know we have several master naturalists who, who've logged in and uh, they, a lot of them are birders. They like to look for birds. They like to look for, uh, for pollinators. Um, 
salamanders, uh, lots of different types of wildlife that they, they like to, to search for. Watershed protection and both the states uh, do have some published best management practices for forestry and that looks at things like the, uh, the correct steepness of your skid trails, how far apart you need to put water bars so that you don't get erosion problems. Looks at things like uh, protecting the streams, protecting uh, waterways when there's a harvest operation or any kind of active management going on. And so those are available online. Uh, I think they're both about 100 pages or so, 100 page booklet that, that lay out those practices that are recommended for, for forestry operations. The, the best management practices also include streamside management zones, because if you're looking at uh, active forestry operations, whether you're installing trails or you're doing a timber harvest, and you have streams, either perennial streams or intermittent streams, there are some practices that need to be followed to make sure that that water stays protected. And an example of that would be um, a stream size ma management zone may say that if you look at the center of the stream and you go out 50 feet on either side, you can only take out 50% of the, of the trees within that zone. And if it's steeper, then you take out fewer trees and it just provides some, some protection for that water. There's a master logger program in Kentucky and there's a similar program here in Virginia, but it's called the SHARP program, the Sustainable Harvesting Resource Professional. And it's what the loggers go through. They get certified, uh, similar to master cattleman or master gardener or master naturalist, but they go through the training and, and both of them have roughly the same type of, of material that's covered during the training. There's uh, logging safety, there's sustainable forestry, and then there's uh, about six hours or a full day on harvest planning and best management practices, talking about how to protect those waterways and make sure that there's no, uh, no damage to those. And then non-timber forest products. Uh, we, Shad and I did the presentation on shiitake and oyster mushrooms using that small diameter wood. Nursery stock is one that uh, people have expressed an interest in collecting uh, plants that could then be cultivated and sold to nurseries. Wreath materials is a big one. Uh, herbs. We talked about ginseng and golden seal, but also uh, a whole list of herbs. I know Appalachian Sustainable Development is doing work with things like black cohosh. Tree syrup, nuts, berries, um, mulch, honey. Those are all things that uh, we would consider non-timber forest products. And on the honey, I'll, I'll mention that a couple years ago, a, uh, a full-time beekeeper I know from Lancaster, Kentucky, he called and he brought 40 hives to Wise County just because he wanted to chase the, the sourwood bloom. He didn't have a lot of sourwoods where he was. So a lot of beekeepers will do that. Um, basswood honey or lynn honey is another one that, that beekeepers will seek. So, so we can consider that a forest product. Threats to the forest, uh, poor management, that can be a, a big threat. And that can include anything from, uh, from cutting wrong to, to poor road design, poor skid trail design, which can then lead to erosion. Generational gaps, that's a, that's a big, uh, big threat to manage forests here in this part of the world. You have a, a grandfather who spent years trying to get his forest managed in a way that's sustainable. And then he doesn't convey that plan to his children and grandchildren and he passes away. And nobody really has a good grasp of what he wanted or maybe not even a firm understanding of what sustainable forestry looks like. And so all that work just kind of fizzles out because uh, that plan and that vision hasn't been, been shared. Fragmentation is one as we would get more development, more housing units that go in. It breaks up that forest so you don't have the contiguous acres that you had before. Invasive species, that's a huge one. Everybody who lives in these three counties should uh, be familiar with a whole list of invasive species from autumn olive, kudzu, multi-floor rose, Johnson grass. Uh, 
those are all some invasives and all of those are just waiting for any kind of disturbance in the forest, whether it's uh, a storm that blows down a few trees to, uh, to a logging operation or a trail development. Once you get that canopy opened up and that sunlight can hit the ground, then the invasives have a good chance of getting established and out competing the natives. Fire is a huge one, a big issue for us here in, in this part of the world. And this is a picture. Um, we see this a lot in, in these three counties. When I was with the Kentucky Division of Forestry, it, it, just, uh, it just amazed me some of the areas in uh, Eastern Kentucky burned every year, the same areas burned over and over. And lots of times you would be at the bottom of a hill looking up and the trees look nice and healthy, but then when you get to the top of the ridge and you look down, you see this kind of fire scarring. And that happens because you got a slope like this and your tree's standing here and the leaf litter and, and all that fuel will pile up on that uphill side. So when a fire burns through, it's that uphill side that gets damaged. So if you've got property and you, you go up on the ridge and look down, that's when you're gonna see the fire damage. And then one that I would consider one of the biggest threats um, and something that's impacted our forest in a major way for a uh, hundred years or longer is the concept of high grading. What high grading is, is um, it's something that's done and people think they're doing a, a good thing in a lot of cases, but it's, it's an idea of, of taking the best and leaving the rest. You go in, you, you select some of the trees that you consider good saw logs and, and you harvest those and you leave the rest behind. And the assumption that a lot of people will make is those smaller trees are younger trees. And once you take out the bigger ones, those smaller ones are gonna, gonna grow bigger and bigger, but that's not always the case. And I can tell you the experience that my family had, my, my father and his brothers and sisters owned some woodland back in Tennessee. And they had an area that was logged in the 1980s. And I remember being a kid and going with my dad and uncles and, and seeing lots of big poplars and big beautiful white oaks in those woods. And they harvested this timber um, and the agreement that they had with the logger is he, they weren't gonna take anything that was smaller than 16 inches in diameter. And if you go back to those woods now, um, me, my, my sons will hunt on that a bit. We'll go back and there are not too many trees that are they're bigger than 16 inches now because the ones that were left behind were a lot of scarlet oaks and things that just were genetically inferior and um, they were already at, at, at their peak diameter. They weren't gonna get much bigger at all. And, and so that really changed the species composition of that forest and really hurt that forest in the long run. But, uh, but the diameter limit cuts, like I'm talking about, that's a type of high grading where you take the best and leave the rest. This uh, forester from Missouri Extension, I, I really like his quote when he was talking about high grading, but he said, it's like a rancher selling a prize winning bull and keeping the losers for breeding. Same thing when you high grade your forest, you sell those nice saw logs and you leave those small crooked ones that are slow growing and genetically inferior, like you see in this picture, you leave those behind and then those contribute to the, to the future of that forest. Like I said, diameter limit harvests, those are a form of high grading. And you hear this all the time. People say, uh, say we're going to be responsible. We're going to be sustainable woodland owners. And, and we're not going to let the logger cut anything that's, that's smaller than 16 inches or 18 inches. Um, but that's a mistake. There's, uh, you just don't know what those genetics are. And, uh, and you may be shooting yourself in the foot over the long haul. So when you think about that, you think about high grading um, and you see a, a log truck and you see 10 inch diameter logs on there, let me, let me ask you to consider this. Are you, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? And uh, I don't know how many times people have come to me and they said, oh, it's, it's, it's awful. They're, they're tearing our woods apart. Um, I, saw, I saw a log truck and there's stuff this big on that, that log truck. And, you know, that's, I would argue that's a good thing. I'd, I'd like you to consider that because that gives a market 
when there's a, a pulpwood market, when there's a wood fiber market, and they can sell this small diameter wood, then that's going to benefit the forest in the long run. That gives you some, some reason to remove that smaller genetically inferior stuff. This is an example. This was over in Grundy, Virginia. I uh, did a forestry tour over there. And, uh, and you can see how small some of this timber is. But I think the average person looks at that truck and they just, and, and that, that, that breaks their heart. They don't want to think about those young, what they think is young trees being removed from those forests. But um, in actuality, that does give some, some markets and, and helps, um, helps cut down on the process of high grading. Talk about the concept of silviculture because silviculture is what comes into play when you're actively managing a forest, when you're working with your forester and your, whether your goals are for wildlife or recreation or watershed protection or timber management or all of the above. Silviculture is the, the art and the science of controlling the establishment of that forest, controlling the growth and the composition for controlling the health and the overall quality of the forest. Basically what you're doing is you're taking your knowledge of the trees and of the sites and the soils and the markets and you're manipulating that forest so that it, it grows in a certain way. It favors certain species over others and, and you end up with a, a, a more managed product than you might have otherwise if you just let it, let it grow on its own. So in order to practice silviculture, it does require a pretty good understanding of what these different species require, whether they can tolerate shade, whether they can tolerate flooding. Uh, it also is gonna really depend on the landowner goals, what the landowner wants to do, uh, and also the ecological benefits, those all come into play so that you can put these practices in motion and you can get the desired outcomes that you're, you're shooting for. So specific silvicultural practices may include things like thinning, harvesting, uh, planting, pruning, prescribed burning, or protection. Those would all be considered steps in the silvicultural process. Those are some examples. This is a table that's taken from University of Tennessee publication. It just looks at some of the common species that we have and it ranks those um, the first column over here, you see two that are labeled tolerance, tolerance, tolerance one and tolerance two. Tolerance one is how tolerant they are of flooding and tolerance two is how tolerant those trees are of shade. So if we look at box elder here, we see that it's very tolerant of flooding, which makes sense because you normally find that along river banks. Um, box elder is also very tolerant of shade. So it could get established underneath sycamores, for example, or, or dense canopies. It, it doesn't have to have full sunlight to get established. So that tells us that, uh, that you can get box elder going underneath uh, the shadow of, of other trees. Just as an example, I kind of pulled out some of our very common trees that we see in our neck of the woods um, and talked about their, their shade tolerance or their shade intolerance. But some of the ones that are intolerant, which uh, sometimes that, that you, you have to stop and think about it, you know, shade intolerance sounds like, uh, like maybe it, it likes uh, a certain type of, uh, of light level, but shade intolerant means that it can't tolerate shade. So it has to have full sunlight to get established. And some examples of shade intolerant would be Macronut hickory, black walnut, sweet gum, tulip poplar, sycamore, black cherry, scarlet oak. All those are shade intolerant. So if you're going in, you're managing your forest and you want any one of these established, you're going to have to start pretty much with a blank slate because you can't get black walnut established underneath the canopy of, uh, of another tree. Uh, if there's shade in there, black walnut, sweet gum, tulip poplar, those are not going to become established. Tulip poplar, um, very often around here, if you've got an old field site and all of a sudden you, you stop cultivating that field and you let it grow up, you'll go through the, 
for a secession process where you'll get uh, you'll get things like sumacs and you'll get things like blackberries growing and then eventually you start to get trees and and normally that's tulip poplar they like to have that full sunlight they like to be out in an open area and you're not going to get those established otherwise some shade tolerant species some species that can become established uh, beneath the canopy we include all our maples, or at least the maples that are common here, red maple, sugar maple. Uh, we looked at box elder. Those are all shade tolerant. They can, they can come up beneath the, uh, and, and really get some growth beneath the, the shade of other trees. Buckeye is one that's shade tolerant. Shell bark hickory, beech, persimmon, green ash, basswood. Those are all shade tolerant species. Hemlock. Hemlock is also a shade tolerant species. And there are some pines that uh, most pines are, are, are shade intolerant, but, uh, but there are some that are, uh, hemlock is in the pine family, it is, it is shade tolerant. So some, uh, again, some specific practices that you may look at if you're, if you're doing uh, forest management work, you'd be, be looking at harvest or regeneration openings, maybe a practice, thinnings, would be one timber stand improvement. Crop tree release is one. A crop tree release is where we look at, we identify the trees that we want to keep and we want to encourage, and then we remove some of the competition that's nearby so that they have more crown and they can spread out. And I know there are several maple syrup producers in the audience tonight. An example of that w would be uh, a couple of us went up and we met. Uh, with a maple producer up in Highland County and they were doing a crop tree release uh, where they were identifying their maples and they were, were removing the competition on a, a couple sides of those sugar maples and they were allowing the canopy to spread out and they were going to study that and just see what that meant for their sugar content over the over the next few years. Prescribed fire is one and, and I will caution you that if you decide that prescribed fire needs to happen on your, your woodland to change the composition of species or some other reason, please, please involve the Kentucky Division of Forestry if you're in Kentucky or the Virginia Department of Forestry if you're in, uh, in Virginia. They'll work with you on that. They will uh, send a crew out. Uh, I think they like, to, they like to start fires. I know I did when I was with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. So they'll work with you on that and they will help you, uh, help you use that tool to manage your, your woodlands. Um, occasionally we'll talk about plantings. Um, here in our part of the world, plantings are very rarely recommended for the simple reason that the natural regeneration is gonna be so vigorous and so fast that it's gonna outcompete. And I've seen that happen. People spend money on tree seedlings, they plant it in a site, and the native trees just overtake them in no time flat. Um, so very rarely would we uh, recommend planting trees in a forestry scenario. An exception might be if you're converting a field or a pasture to forest land. And in a case like that, you might, uh, you might benefit from, from planting some young seedlings. This is a good illustration, I think, of Timber stand improvement, and uh, for those of you who tuned in when we were talking about shiitake mushrooms, this is a, an illustration that I used. But one way to think about timber stand improvement is it's the exact opposite of high grading, where high grading you'd go in and you take out the productive, the high value trees, and you'd leave the garbage. With timber stand improvement, you go in and you take out the, the low quality trees. Like here's one that's, that's crooked and got a lot of limbs. Here's one that's suppressed by the other trees. It's been out, out overcrowded. You've got one, uh, maybe a species that's not real conducive to the health of that forest or the value of that forest. Uh, so you would take out those trees and then that opens it up for your higher value trees to grow and gives them some room. Now the challenge is there's not always an economic incentive to go in and do this timber stand improvement. Um, so uh, most people who put that into play, they will try to get some cost share money, or maybe they have a use for this wood. Maybe they want to uh, harvest some firewood, for example, and they can use these 
low value trees for firewood production or use it for shiitake or oyster mushroom production. So that gives you some type of market or some type of use for that wood. Otherwise that can be pretty expensive just to go in and either do it yourself or hire somebody to go in and do the timber stand improvement without being able to, to market or, or see some kind of return on that investment. So I want to talk just uh, one slide here about this concept of clear cutting. And I know that's one of those words like GMOs that has a whole lot of, of, of negative emotion attached to it. And in a lot of cases, it's, it's rightly so. It is certainly a practice that is misused a lot. Uh, clear cutting can be, um, can be used very detrimentally and, and cause some damage. But what I want you to keep an open mind about is it is another tool that can accomplish some of those forestry goals that we've talked about. Um, again, going back to the high grading, one of the ways that you can reset that whole concept of high grading is through a properly executed clear cut. You can open up that forest and, and let things, we talked about the seeds and the rootstock that stays alive and active for years. Well, the, high, the, the clear cutting would open that up and let that, that young forest become established again. Uh, going back to that woodland that is in my hometown that my, my dad and his brothers and sisters had harvested, really and truly, if they had gone and they'd cleared cut that, clear cut that in the 80s, that would be a much healthier, more productive stand than it is right now, where they did the diameter limit cut, they changed the species composition, and it's not nearly as healthy a forest as it was um, you know, 40, 50 years ago. When you're talking about a harvest operation, one of the things that people worry about is, is the erosion. Um, but normally that erosion is gonna be concentrated on the roads and the skid trails. That's where you're gonna see the compaction. If you're looking at the forest floor itself, uh, that infiltration rate is gonna stay constant. So if you go in and you put down a ring and you pour in a gallon of water and you time it to see how fast that moves into the soil, you do that before harvest and you do that after harvest, that infiltration rate is still gonna be the same. The transpiration rate and the nutrient cycling and the soil temperatures, those are things that will change after a, a harvest operation. Uh, transpiration rate is just when the trees take up that water and they use it for their processes like, uh, like photosynthesis and then it evaporates from the leaves. That transpiration rate, uh, immediately after harvest, it's gonna be quite a bit less. Um, so, so you're gonna have more water going into the, the stream channels after a harvest, especially after a clear cut. But, um, but usually within about five years in this part of the world, that transpiration rate, the nutrient cycling, and the soil temperatures are gonna be back pretty close to pre-harvest levels. Uh, that's within five years or quicker. Now, the big question is, that waiting for that five years, what's going to happen? Uh, so that's where, where good management comes in, make sure that the, the harvest is done in a very responsible way up front. Again, like I said, the greatest erosion on the clear cut is going to be with those skid trails and those haul roads because that's where the compaction takes place. And, um, and that's why the best management practices really talk about the steepness of those roads and trails. And uh, they really focus on putting the water bars at, at certain distances so that that rainwater is diverted into a, a favorable location. Um, again, with, with clear cutting or, or really any kind of, kind of operation, harvesting operation, you do have to be mindful of site conditions. You gotta have some understanding of the underlying geology. Uh, Invasive species is a big one. Again, anytime there's a disturbance, whether it's caused by, by logging or it's caused by wind or weather, um, those invasives are just waiting for a chance to, to move in. And then you have to be especially mindful of streams and water quality. It's also good to have a, a very good follow-up plan so that you can go in after the harvest and you can start dealing with some of these issues that may arise like a, like an onslaught of invasives. What do you do a year after a clear cut when you're, 
starting to see all these autumn olives move into a site. So it's good to have that follow-up plan. And there are some alternative approaches to clear cutting that I know the Forest Service has started using those just because it's, uh, it, it, it's a little more uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, and a couple of those are, uh, they're called a seed tree harvest, where six to 15 good, uh, valuable, genetically superior uh, trees are left per acre. And then a shelter wood harvest where 20 to 50 trees per acre are left. And this illustration here, this is, um, this is a seed tree establishment where if we're talking about clear cutting, if you look up here at the mature stand, clear cutting would involve taking all these down. But with a seed tree, you're gonna leave these six to 15 trees per acre. And again, these are top quality trees. These are not the junk. These are good trees that you leave behind. So you leave those behind and then there comes a point where you start getting this regeneration beneath those trees. And then once that regeneration is established, then you come in and you harvest those seed trees or those shelter wood trees later on. And at this point it acts very similar to, to what a clear cut would do, but you've, you've added another step in here, something that's a little more pleasing to the public. Um, you've left these trees on here to be, to provide a seed source and uh, just, just look a little better than if it would, had been completely cleared. But you, you still get the same ultimate effect of, uh, of what you would get with clear cutting. We'll talk about age classifications. That's something that you may hear a bit. Um, even age forest where all the trees are roughly the same age, that of course is gonna result after a clear cut or after some event that opens that forest up. You'll also get two age forests. Um, and a good example of that around here, I think, would be if you look at this, at this drawing here on the right, you have mature trees. Um, and a good example would be, uh, let's say we have a, a stand with yellow poplar, tulip poplar growing here. And we said that that's a, a shade intolerant species. It, it got established in an open area. And then once those are established, those trees are mature then you might have something like sugar maple, which likes a similar type of habitat, then it starts coming in. And, and so you've essentially got two different forests on the same footprint that you're managing. You've got your yellow poplars up here, but you're looking in the future, you're gonna have sugar maples that come in. So that's what we call a, a two age forest. An uneven age forest is when you've got three or more different age classes within a, a given woodland. And, and that will result if you're uh, doing selective harvest, if you go in and you, you take out uh, you know, high grading, the, does, it, it can result in uneven age forest. It's where you take out certain trees and then you've got these different levels of growth that are happening in the forest. Um, but with an uneven age forest, you're eventually gonna end up with, with a lot of uh, shade uh, in uh, shade tolerant species. That's what's going to eventually make things up. So if you're a landowner and you're looking for assistance and uh, you, you've got some woodlands that you want to manage, the first step is going to be the forest stewardship program. And again, uh, you want to contact the Virginia Department of Forestry or the Kentucky Division of Forestry and you can contact your extension agent and we can put you in touch with those folks. It's free to get a forest stewardship plan in Kentucky. So, uh, so no cost or obligation whatsoever. If you own at least 10 acres of woodland, call the Kentucky Division of Forestry and they will, will draw up a forest stewardship plan for you at absolutely no charge. In Virginia, there is a cost associated with that plan. It's $1.50 per acre with a $200 minimum. So you do have to pay for that in, in Virginia. Another option would be to go through a private consultant forester. And again, myself and the other agents, we, we can get you a list of consultant foresters who practice in our area. And, um, and some of those are even approved to do these forest stewardship plans. I know when I was a, a forester in Kentucky, we had a list of consultant foresters and they would draw up the forest stewardship plans for folks just like we would as uh, state foresters. 
um, and then our agency would pay them. The landowner still didn't didn't have to pay the consultant forester. So that that's an option. Usually, having a forest stewardship on file is going to be the first step to get cost share funds like through the NRCS or the USDA Forest Service. And some of the the cost share programs that are in existence are the Conservation Stewardship Program, the Conservation Reserve Program, and EQIP, or the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And in some cases, you can get 50% um, uh, of the cost of a project of, of improving your forest. And it may be fencing livestock out of your woods or protecting the, the soil or the, the water within a wood lot. But you can get some funding that would, uh, would help you with some of these goals. There's also an organization called the National Woodland Owners Association, which I would encourage you to, to consider. Uh, they do a lot of good stuff. They have some conferences and uh, I think they do a newsletter and, and possibly even a magazine that can give you some good information. There's also some certification programs. You're probably familiar with the American Tree Farm System. You've, you've seen these signs here and there. Um, so you can get signed up with those. And a lot of the, um, the state foresters are, uh, and, and as well as the consultant foresters, are approved through the American Tree Farm System to, uh, to get you into those programs and get you that recognition. Other certification programs are the Forest Stewardship Council. I think they're, I think they're based in Mexico, or they used to be, and then the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. This was uh, in the early 2000s. This was back when Pierce Brosnan was still James Bond, but I remember there was a, uh, a media blitz trying to encourage uh, consumers to buy their lumber from. Uh, from certified forests. And this was through the Forest Stewardship Council. They, they ran these full page ads. I think Piers Brosnan, I think Olivia Newton-John, and there were a couple of other uh, famous folks who, who had full page ads trying to encourage people. When you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, look for this seal, and that will tell you that that forest has been man managed sustainably. And um, I think this was in GQ Magazine. Because I think uh, I think most woodland owners I know they they do read GQ. Um, Kentucky may have an uh, extension resource. I know Virginia does. Comes out quarterly. The Virginia Forest Landowner E Update uh, comes comes out via email. Have a list of different events that are coming up that woodland owners and others may be interested in. Um, so that's a pretty good uh, good thing to sign up for. If you're interested in that, I can get you the link, and it, it takes 30 seconds to, to sign up for that. So if you're, if you're selling timber, I don't know if anybody's in that boat, but, um, but do encourage you to work with a consultant forester. They understand the silviculture. They understand the markets. And um, when my family sold their timber back in the 80s, I remember they sold it on shares. And that's really the, the way that most people do it, where the, the logger would, he would, would take the logs to the mill, and then what he got paid, he would come back to the landowner and say, hey, I got this much, and I'm going to give you 30% of it, I'm going to give you 50% of it, or whatever that agreement was. And that's not how we typically, in most cases, recommend that you sell. We, we recommend that you sell through a sealed bid process and um, consultant forester can help you with that. And they normally would do that on a percentage basis. I've seen situations and it's not really unusual at all where if a consultant forester is selling a, a tract of timber for a woodland owner, it's not unusual for the difference between those low bids and those high bids to, to differ by 300%. So even though you're, you're given that forester percentage of your timber sale value, um, he or she can probably end up getting you more money in the long run for that, uh, for the, for that timber. Um, with the sale bid process, you get your money up front. So your money is in the bank and it's collecting interest before they even move the, the loggers onto the site. So you've already got your money up front. 
recommend using a contract and the consultant forester will be familiar with the contract process. You can also find good examples on, on most of the extension service websites. The consultant forester can provide harvest oversight if that's the agreement you have with him or her. So they don't just sell your timber and go, they can stay on and they can make sure that the BMPs are being followed, that the, the operation is being done in a sustainable way. They can be very involved in the layout of the skid trails and the roads and the landings, and that can be a pretty valuable service. And then they can also uh, play a role in post-harvest management if you work that, uh, that out with them in, up, up front. So that once the, the harvest is done, once the loggers have left, then they work with you on getting the timber um, and, and getting the forest back where it needs to be. And, and they can help with things like the, uh, the invasive species and the species composition. And it may be necessary to follow up with a prescribed burn or something like that down the road but your consultant forester would be able to provide those types of services for you. This is a uh, stumpage report that we get every quarter and uh, I can put you on the mail list for this or I can just forward this to you. Um, this just, just basically lumps things, uh, the state of Virginia into two sections. We're area one here in the, uh, the, the western half of the state and area two is is the eastern half. But what this does is just, just comes up with some uh, some average prices that were seen during that that particular quarter for both saw timber and um, and pulpwood tonnage. So we saw, saw that this first quarter of 2020 here in our area, oak saw timber, it was averaging uh, 432 dollars per thousand board feet. Mixed hardwoods were 282.78. And um, I think I have, yeah, an example here. I know when I was in Eastern Kentucky, we would normally tell landowners that uh, the minimum that most of the loggers at that time would consider if, if you wanna do a harvest, really 2,500 board feet per acre would be about the minimum. So as an example here, uh, if, if we're going by these prices, these stumpage prices, uh, say your forester goes in and sees that you average about 3,000 board feet per acre of red oak, well, that's going to mean, based on these prices, that the value of that timber is going to be about $1,300 per acre. But that's, that's going to depend on a lot of different things, your proximity to markets and, and so forth. So... Um, just, just summarizing the process of working with a forester, first thing is a stewardship plan, whether you're working with a state uh, agency or with a consultant forester, get that stewardship plan written. And the, the forester will come in, will analyze the woodland condition, talk to you, find out what your goals are, um, estimate the timber volume, and put that in a written report. And then again, that, that document, that forest stewardship plan is gonna be a prerequisite for certain cost share programs that you may qualify for. If you decide along with your forester that a timber sale is something you want and it's feasible, then that, uh, that forester could do a little more intensive look at the volume of timber uh, and then start to contact those potential buyers. We'll invite them in, show them the timber, uh, and then have a day where, where the, the loggers will turn in a sealed bid and then um, he or she will open those and you have your money in the bank before the harvest even begins. Uh, and again, you can work with that forester to oversee the, the harvest and the follow-up. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing there and just see if there are any questions. But if you all have any and you, you don't want to type them into the chat, just uh, just feel free to, looks like uh, Jeremy has shared a lot of the documents here. So thank you for that, Jeremy, a lot of those links. Okay, so are there, are there any questions at this point? Basically, what's in there, Phil, is just uh, the BMP guides from Virginia and Kentucky. And I noticed that uh, Virginia even has a technical guide, a field guide and a technical guide. So, right. Kentucky only has a field guide. So, uh, 
And then also with the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association, the National and the Virginia group as well. So the websites are there if y'all want to copy and paste those. Or, or you can go down there at the lower right hand corner and click on those uh, three dots and it'll allow you to uh, save that chat. So. Oh yeah, uh, Jerry, uh, he commented, he's, I know Jerry's been, been very involved in forestry as well. But he pointed out that one important factor concerning harvesting is establishing property lines. Yes. Thank you for saying that, Jeremy. Uh, not Jerry. Jerry, thank you for saying that. Um, I, I did have a landowner, I remember, in Pike County, Kentucky, once upon a time. They were absentee landowners. I think they lived in, in Michigan. And they came in and they called me and uh, they said somebody had stolen some of their timber. And usually that's two or three trees. But I think, if I remember right, I think they'd had about 50 acres harvested while they were, were living out of town. So, uh, so yeah, the property lines, that's a big, a big thing to, to be aware of. Definitely. I think in Kentucky, it's like, what, three times the stumpage? Yes. What is it in Virginia? Is it about the same? It's the same. It's, it's hard that, very rare that anybody gets yeah, that. But that's, that's what they're... I think three times is if you if it's proven that, that it's deliberate, intentional, mm -hmm. yeah. knowingly doing it. Yeah, which is, is hard to prove. Yeah. yeah. We would have to have a survey done and usually uh, most folks don't have their property formally surveyed and marked, but if it is surveyed and marked, that's what it would take. I've even known timber companies to go into adjacent landowners and say, Are, uh, is this your line? And they'll say, yeah, and they'll go in and they'll mark it with, uh, you know, boundary ribbons uh, to let, uh, you know, to let the log crew know that, hey, don't, you know, they've already made contact with the landowner. And uh, so I know some really good logging firms that's going out there and done that, that they'll go out and contact the landowner and say, hey, you know, the adjacent landowner, send them a letter and then say, hey, if you got any questions, give us a call. We'll come out, walk the property boundary, make sure that we don't get on your property. And they'll even mark the property uh, where everybody feels that the property line should be. Right. And that's, that's a pretty good logger, in my opinion. Yeah. No, oh, that's very good. Yeah. And mark plenty of property lines, following old fences, mm -hmm. looking at old deeds and meander the ridge and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. And a lot of times you can tell pretty close where the property line is just by land use, prior land use or current land use. You, mm -hmm. you can see uh, change in timber size and, and even land use like some of it maybe has been farmed at one time and have been small timber but there are ways of kind of picking up on where the property line is but right. to you it's good to ask questions right definitely i'll tell you my boss uh when i worked with the kentucky division of forestry he had been a consultant forester and he talked about uh, doing some uh some work in virginia and uh, talked about running across deeds that, that George Washington had actually been involved in those deeds. I thought that's, uh, that, that would be pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I ran across a deed over there in Kentucky that uh, one of the corners called for out in the field where the bull stands. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Some of them were hatchet throws too. Right. Um, yep. And, rods and so forth. Right. These are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, on the, in Virginia that actually does the prescribed burning, is there uh, a group that, that works to try to operate within the law or is there somebody that you <laughs> contract to do that? I heard part of that question. You were asking if, if you wanted to get a prescribed burn done, if there's a group that you would go, go through. Is that... Somebody that you could actually contract to have that done through. I'm, I'm sure there would be, but, but again, they would have to coordinate pretty closely with the Department of Forestry. Um, and and that, you'd probably get some free labor out of it because I'm, I'm sure that, uh, I, and again, when I was with the Kentucky Division of Forestry, we we like to set in fires about as well as we like putting them out. So, uh, so I'm, I'm sure they'd probably work with you on that. You've described most Kentuckians. 
I sure wouldn't want the liability of it. Well, and that's the issue. They've tried in Kentucky several times to um, to get legislation that would allow for burning, uh, uh, that would kind of keep the the liability <clears throat> to a, a reasonable level, and that's tricky. You know, even if the state does it, if it gets away, that's just a PR nightmare. Yeah. Bill, on the clear cutting issue, mm -hmm. I, I, early on, I guess I was a strictly a selective cutting type of person. You know, that's the only type of harvesting I really supported and believed in. But right. you know, over the years and associated and involved with logging, I've really moved more toward the clear cutting opinion right. as a, this way to manage forests for the most part. To just uh, I guess the main thing is on selective cutting is I've just see, I've seen so much damage to uh, the trees remaining. You know they end up yeah. scarred and yeah. tops broke out of them. And, uh, I don't know. I just uh, I just really feel like clear cutting is kind of I just kind of view managing timber as like a crop of corn. You know you go in and. Mm -hmm. How to even age and take it out all together and start all over. Mm -hmm. And the right. the uh, seed tree thing to me just doesn't work well here in, in the mountains and deciduous forest because you get so much stump sprouts. Right. The seed source is really worthless. Yeah. It might work all right in uh, conifers or you know pines or so forth, but right. you know where you don't get the sprouts. But those sprouts out. The seeds just don't stand a chance. Right. And, and I think in most cases, the Forest Service, the motiv motivation may be more the aesthetics with, with that, just, um, just so they can show an alternative to the clear cutting process that they, they're leaving some residual trees and, and getting some, some benefit from, from that standpoint. Well, but then if, yeah, if you add another, another step to the rotation, you know, you, you have your cutting and leave some seed trees and then go back later once re everything's revegetated and try to harvest those seed yeah. trees then you're right. turning things up again absolutely and uh, i don't know i just like i said i'm i'm more in favor of just taking it all and starting all over right and and you know when i was a forester in eastern kentucky and a lot of people don't uh, it, it's hard for them to believe this but when we'd work with landowners and uh they were going to sell timber it was kind of hard for us to convince the loggers to do the do the clear cuts because we we didn't have a pulpwood market at the time it was all saw timber and so even in cases where we'd recommend a pretty substantial opening um, they still want to go in and select the select the better ones and essentially do a do a high grade but uh, you know everybody wants to assume that it's a greed thing but but really a lot of loggers it's it's not it's, it's cheaper for them to do the selective harvest in a lot of cases and just uh, oh, yeah it's economics do they catch crap when they go to the market if they've got that load i mean i know they do from the public but is it kind of a macho thing if they roll in at the log yard and they've got a load of small diameter logs do they i i, I haven't heard uh, anybody say that that's yeah, a... there's something to that yeah is there... <laughs> Everybody likes to have a load of big red oak or poplar logs. Yeah. Show off. Yeah. They sneak those small ones in at night. Is yeah. <laughs> I had a question for you about when you do those uh, selective harvests or uh, um, in addition to breaking down the, the good trees that remain, how do they respond? Uh, to, to sun scald, uh, you know, that's going to be part of the conversation uh, next go around, but I, I know what it is on maples, but what is it on your oaks? Do they have the same issue? Well, I know one issue that you have with, with certain species, and that's again where the silviculture comes in and the, the knowledge of the species, but, but certain species are very prone to what's called epicormic branching. And white oaks and yellow poplars in particular are very prone to that. And so you've got this nice uh, poplar or this nice white oak growing in the shaded forest. Well, when you open up part of that and the sunlight hits that trunk, 
then you get these little uh, little shoots coming out on the trunk, and that, that can lower the value of those trees. And uh, but the epicormic branching, yeah, that's that's one response to once you get those openings created. Another loss associated with clear cutting is is where the clear cutting stops. The trees right up against the clear cutting are really subject to wind damage. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of trees uprooted right along the edge of clear cuts. Matter of fact, right. I've got some of that on my property. Right. They clear cut it, and and it was even worse because it was right on a ridge top. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Got a tornado through here six years ago, and and it just made me sick to walk through the forest and see all the large trees that were on the ground. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, trees when they're in a community like that, they kind of protect each other, and uh, they can withstand a lot more wind. But you take some of that protective away from them, and, and they're more susceptible, especially along the edges. Yep, absolutely. Good job, Phil. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, yeah, any questions at all, just contact uh, myself or or the other agents, Jeremy or Shad and uh, we'll try to get you the information that you need. Thanks, Phil. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all for attending. We've got a good good lineup next week. Uh, we've got for Monday, we've got bed bugs, information on bed bugs. That we get a lot of calls on that uh, uh, at, the, at the office, so we get a lot of calls on that. Also, uh, if you if you're into raising, uh, you know, a lot of produce, if you're marketing through farmer's market or whatever, we're going to be on Tuesday night discussing direct marketing. Um, on uh, Wednesday night, we've got Dr. John Strang back again, and he's going to be doing some uh, talking about pruning of fruit trees, brambles, blueberries, that sort of thing. And then also uh, on Thursday, we've got uh, forest management part two. So that's kind of our schedule for next week, uh, Monday through Thursday. All right. Good evening, folks. Good to see everybody. Have a great evening. Good weekend.